Welcome to Surviving Saturday, a podcast about holding on to hope in the midst of life's difficulties, disappointments, and dark seasons. Times like that remind us of the agony and despair the followers of Jesus felt on the Saturday of Easter weekend, in between the Friday on which he was crucified and the Sunday on which he rose from the dead. That Sunday forever changed the way that humans can relate to God. But what does it look like to be honest about the very real pain we experience in the in-between? To fervently cling to hope in the God who promised us His peace and His presence, at times when He feels distant or even cruel. I'm Wendy Osborne, a licensed counselor in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I'm her husband, Chris, a marriage mediator, conflict resolution coach, and trauma-informed story work coach. Join us each episode for authentic conversations about how life not turning out as we'd expected has created the contextual soil for the growth of a tenacious hope in the resurrection and in a God who is still making all things new. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Surviving Saturday podcast. This is a part two of a just two-part series that we're doing about transformation and transitioning and being formed into the people that God wants us to be. Um, We all have heard the idea of, oh gosh, yes, be imitators of Christ and just try to be like Jesus. And I don't know about other people's experience, but the way I feel like I've gotten closer to him and hoping to be, to show up and live and love more like him has not been by, I think I'll decide. I think I will do it. Now is the time. Let me put on these um, characteristics. It's been a process for me more of, of Wendy referred last time to sort of being uprooted and being kind of mowed down almost, uh, like a plant. Um, and I resonate with some of that, but there's probably some other metaphors that that work for me, but it's, it's had to be forged. It's had to be, I feel like God's got to, had to, had to do a lot more work on the soil and the substrate. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, you know? Um, so yeah, I was thinking, as I was thinking about you and coming back, just with my plant man- metaphor, and it's probably going to be a different one for you, but I feel like you're in a season of being transplanted. Transplant. That is good. I hadn't even thought of that word for it. Um, yeah, so from your work with your garden fairy, and you've done some transplanting around the yes. house. Like, How do you know when you need to transplant, when you need to take a plant from one place to another what does that look like usually the little guy is like busting out of the pot so if you like put your hands around the plastic pot you will feel it bulging it's like getting too big for its little plant britches okay um and and can you tell it in terms of like the health of the plant uh yeah because these plants they will communicate with you and if they need something or they don't like what you're giving them, like the pot's too small or the sunlight or the watering is not right, they will, you know, the first obvious thing is they'll wilt. But after that, they, I've had little guys that like just shed all their leaves. And they're like, well, fine, I'm not going to have any leaves for you. And they just drop them all. Okay. Well, for some reason, um, yeah, I want to think more about that metaphor because I had not really couched it in those terms the the metaphor that has felt apt for me has much more been and it's somewhat maybe hackneyed and overused but the idea of a caterpillar cocooning okay and then emerging as a butterfly which i sort of learned the you know eighth grade Mm -hmm. science level of it's like oh yeah they are you know just in this little cocoon and they're just kind of sitting there hanging out and the change stuff happens and oh butterfly wings but I read and had some some uh, learning on that not too long ago, and there's actually some serious stuff going down in the cocoon. Yeah, like what, there what's is, happening in there? There's like wrestling and digestion, and like the old parts of the caterpillar really have to be sort of somehow ground up or, or you know, they're, they have to fall away and die off. And then if you think about it, like we can picture a bird, you know, oh, they, the birds come out with wings, you know, mm-hmm. they just can't use them to start with, but... Wings have to come from somewhere in that caterpillar, and then they have to kind of get strength. And from what I've heard and what I've learned, they are, as they're stretching, as those wings are stretching against the cocoon that's holding them in, that's where they're building strength. That's like, that's where they're doing their reps. They're like doing, Ah. the muscles are are growing, and, and the first thing they have to do is sort of 
you know, survive being in this darkness, but then they kind of break out, but it's still a process. It's not like one second they're in there, and the next well, second they're flying. It's There's it's still a, this struggle and wrestling, and it's sticky for a while, and the stuff is holding on to you. It's a bloody process. It is. Because when the kids were little, we ordered one of those little kits in the mail that was like, grow your own butterflies. Yes, I remember with the whole netting and everything. Yeah, so it comes with all these caterpillars, and you put them inside this big kind of nylon cage yeah and it has mesh and they build their cocoons and then you watch the cocoons and the directions kind of tell you about how long you'll be watching the cocoons and i remember the kids getting up one morning and being like mom i think they're dead and there's blood everywhere oh my gosh and yeah. it turns out there were actually butterflies but they had in coming out of the cocoon a whole lot happens it's messy it's like it a birth is, yes it is a birth and that that has felt more resonant for me in this last season because i i really it did kind of come to me probably last year even at some point like where i've been has been somewhat like cocooning oh. like more of a withdrawal from some things in my life some yeah. people some relationships some like vocationally, especially just yeah. kind of like, you know what? I've had a law firm, a small law firm with people that I employed. I've had a, a education business with people I employed and trying to go around and do a lot of presentations, things like that. But over the last year, probably almost exactly, um, stepping away from that or shrinking that down to just be me, my law firm is just me and doing more mediations, but also doing a lot just for the formation of my soul and really just ah. wrestling with okay who actually am i supposed to be i've mm -hmm. i've had i've been blessed with a a you know a rich and rewarding legal career i've taught law school i've uh worked as a mediator and collaborative family lawyer and all of that has been good but it hasn't been the thing it hasn't been i, I started probably two years ago wrestling with i'm still not in the place where i think i'm supposed to or maybe i'm not the person i'm supposed to be that's Sort of, it's sort of tied up with vocational for me. And maybe those were places for other times. Yes, yes. Yeah. I think they were formative for sure. But there was this sense of, it's not settled. Mm -hmm. I'm not like at the end destination. Like yeah. neither of the ventures that I helped build and started just took off and became its own thing. Even the, you know, three years teaching as a law professor, which was awesome. And I loved it. And then that law school has terrible problems and I got out before it went completely to shit but it basically I thought I was there I thought yeah. oh this is it and then um, it closed it closed yeah, yeah it closed after I left and and really a couple of years ago I started just wrestling with that grieving some of that um and and exploring well it, you know if I'm not gonna stay doing what I'm doing what's that going to look like um and and really the last year I would say has been agonizing um it's been lonely it's been hard at times um and i'm an extrovert i love being around people but i i was you know found myself more at first i was thinking it's kind of like an island but it wasn't an island it, this cocoon idea has uh -huh. made more sense because i think i went into i remember i went into 2023 with sort of uh, in our in our faith community in our church, we go to several people choose like a word of the year, and kind of what's your word of the year? What's mm -hmm. God developing in you? What's you know raising up in you this yeah, year? Yeah, kind of what's your intention for the year? Yes, yeah. and I remember the word. I think I chose a word for twenty twenty two, and it was threshold. I felt like I'm on the threshold of something. I feel like something's coming. Something's got to change. I don't know what. Yeah, and I sort of started exploring that, and being open to that, and I was looking at you know a lot of different things. Went through that year, and and the next, like last year, I chose the word one. And the word I chose... One as in... The number one. one yes. The number one. Okay. And and, and the, the prayer and the idea behind that was, what is the one thing, God, that you want me to do? I've worn multiple hats. I, there's part of me that likes wearing multiple hats. But then there's like, yeah, but what's the one thing that I need to be about all the time? I can see themes... Mm -hmm. flowing through all the things I've done. Yeah. The intersection of the counseling world, mental health world, and law is where I've done speaking presentation, and I love the intersection of that. But but what's the one way that that's going to manifest is sort mm -hmm. of what I was really 
trying to, to pray with and re- pray and wrestle through. And it was probably around this time last year, I started really actually opening my heart back up to the idea of actually, it might be that I need to just get educated in counseling uh-huh. and move towards yeah. counseling. And, and, and I started getting more, leaning more into that passion where I've been counseling adjacent, certainly uh-huh. beneficiary of all this counseling. Um, and what would that look like? And I remember for years I had said, you know, if I could snap my fingers and do it, I would, but I can't, so I won't. And uh, then sort of what gets happening is, is something gets stirred in me and I decided that, well, let me start moving that direction. And some of that has been, you know, kind of following some of your lead, honestly, watching the places where you experience healing and growth and transformation. And, and you were gracious enough to say, you know, you might enjoy doing that as well. So, uh, the narrative focused trauma care at mm-hmm. Allender has been powerful for that to be yeah. in the presence of other people sort of seeing you and inviting you to be more your real self mm-hmm. is the best way I can put it in, in short term. Like people seeing, hey, here's how you show up and how much of that is reactionary or loyalty to where you came from and how you were formed and how much of that, you know, how you can show up is what God has imbued you with, as, as put in you. Um, and so that sort of, I think, doing NFTC1 was, was a big format in this. And then I did two last year leading into going, um, I'm coming up on the anniversary, actually, of going to Recovery Week mm-hmm. um, with Dan Allender and, and Jay and Adam and all that. And it was just, I, I, I remember, I would know, just treasure it, just the... Yeah, those men have have very much formed you yes. in the last few years. Yes. Um how would you describe what Jesus has done in you through them and also apart from them? But but what has he done? What's he been up to? I think it's been partly there's been a stripping away of you know, being on a stage, being able to perform, command be in charge. There's been a lot of just dismantling mm. of that. And not for the sake of just complete destruction and we're just going to kill us, but like there's aspects of that that are, are truly closer to me than what I was doing before. Like the idea now of going back and being just a litigator like I was for the first 20 years of my career, mm. no. You know, I, I, I don't even resonate with that. Like I feel like a different person. Yeah. Um, but what are, what are the com- what is the necessary thing? So I would say, it's an invitation, really, to my own healing, yeah. like to dive deeper into more of my story. How did I get formed to to care about the things I do? To have the buttons that I have that can get pushed, the triggers, but also the passions that I have. Um, and it really it feels like I use the metaphor a lot of a wrestling match with God. Mm-hmm. But it, in the last year, it's been like I'm wrestling in this cocoon. And I started feeling, oh, this is where the the stretching and the, the growth is happening. And, but, but for a lot of the time, it just felt dark. Mm-hmm. And it felt lonely and it felt foreign, I think. Um, well, I, I was there for one of the times Dan put words... To the darkness you were up against. Oh, yes. And helped you see there was a pathway out, but it would be a costly pathway. Yes. To go from the darkness into the light that God has made you for and the light of who he has made you. Yes. It was at a marriage retreat in October of 22. And uh, it was a small, intimate marriage retreat where it was like three couples with Dan and Becky and then yeah. three couples with Steve and Lisa Call, who we love tremendously. Um, and the purpose was to dive into your story and how does it show up in your marriage? Mm-hmm. How does it show up for you in life now? And Dan kind of came straight at an aspect of my family story mm-hmm. that I was very uncomfortable with and that I... I think you, in my observation, you felt the need to protect it. Yeah. Because I think to let it be demolished, what I felt, and you can disagree with this, 
was if you were to let it be dismantled, then what would you have left? And he was calling that into question. Yes. Yeah. And he's building on, I think a few months before that I had sat with Jay and dots had been connected and things that I did not understand about my story. Dark places that, you know, had had been hidden um, because of the way my particular family trauma played out. Um, and then Dan kind of comes at it and sort of provoked him. My, my initial response was anger. I think, I think I said very, very unkind, very cruel things back to him. Like, who the hell are you to, uh-huh. I don't think I used that even nicer word. Um, you didn't. Um, but and, Dan can take it. He, he, yeah. he is more committed to healing than his own safety. Well, and the people who are around us as well, it was this fascinating mix mm-hmm. where everybody was on a journey. Oh, gosh, yes. There were some people who were like super rock stars in their career, and they were getting laid low in their family and their ability to trust in their own competence, which was yeah. off the charts. They were competent freaking people yep. and let losses and death and challenges yeah. were taking them out and seeing them lean in and them see, we could see stuff for them. They could see stuff for us. This, this community of realness, yep. I think we got a taste of it there. And then I got a little bit of it, but it wasn't quite the full thing. I went to a conference a year ago with a bunch of folks in law who are trying to bring trauma-informed principles into law. And I'm like, yeah, these are my people too. This, this resonates, but it wasn't healing and transformative enough for me. But then going to recovery week, one of the best things about it was when you arrived, it's funny, we're all gathering at the airport waiting for the bus to take us to the beautiful retreat center outside Seattle. And everybody knows why you're there. You're there mm-hmm. to come talk about abuse and harm from mm-hmm. your family of origin. And so there was no room for fakery. It was kind of very freeing. Yeah. We've joked about it since. I've stayed in touch with several of those men. A couple of them have become really dear friends. And we talked about, golly, wasn't it nice to just not have to pretend for a second? Like you couldn't pretend yeah. for a second. Nobody's going to let you. But also you knew why you were there. Uh, in fact, we were riding on the bus to... Uh, yeah, um, there were, I think we we're in two different groups of folks, uh, two different buses. But one of the buses, like the the driver asked, "So, what are y'all in town for?" And one guy just goes, "Well, we're all going on a retreat to process sexual abuse in our past, or something like yeah, that." Just, yeah. There was something about naming the truth that was just freeing, um, and and it it, it, it you know it, it doesn't mean everybody was perfect, and and there weren't you know relational stuff to to be worked through. Uh, it, we were all in process. But the realness that I experienced there with Dan, Wendell. Well, um, I think when you have grace for yourself to be in process. Yes. You're willing to have grace for other people who are also on their journey. Well, and that's what I saw happen. So that's what I would say. That really catalyzed um, just... I realized the one thing that Jesus was doing in me is like making me a different person that was actually freeing me up from so much pressure to get what's the vocational setting, what is the thing I'm supposed to do, became secondary. Mm -hmm. And God was like, I got more for you on who you're supposed to be. And I felt that happening as I'm there with these men. And basically, the the whole process is geared towards honesty Mm -hmm. and telling your story and then recognizing that None of us can tell our story honestly and accurately. We're not objective reporters of it, especially when it's things from childhood. We have a child's brain perspective on it, right. which has tried to make sense of it a certain way and cast the characters yeah. in a certain light because your child brain is making sense of all this. Then when other people enter in with you and engage with that with wisdom and kindness, they are naming stuff that your little, my little brain was not able to, to handle. No. I couldn't have named how how horrific certain aspects of this were, mm-hmm. how troubling they were. Right. Um at that age because nobody can. You can't. Right. Your brain at that age is trying to make sense of the world in a way that will help you survive. Yeah. And so you're black and white. There's good guys, there's bad guys. You're trying to just, and and then you adopt a role. And that's yes. I think a part of what I really was introduced to there's a role that I was groomed into, shaped into, that I started forming that really set me up mm-hmm. and set me up to interact in the world a certain way. And, and not when you were d- young, 
it kept you in connection with people that you needed to be connected with. It with did. Caregivers. It it worked, and it, I I learned how to play the game. I was youth group kid. I was co valedictorian, smart guy. I looked polished because yeah. I was determined. Yep. To look good. Uh, full not, not scholarship good. to college, full scholarship to law school. You learned, yeah, you learned your role and how you could make it in the world. When I learned uh, to, I mean, my brain and my mouth would basically be what would get me through life. And yeah. some of my kindness, but brain and mouth and ability to talk were where I would go to. Um, and, and in this real community, that kind of stuff is stripped away. And people are like... I've had multiple people in either in NFTC or in that training say, love your words, appreciate that you are gifted with words. And you know, words are, uh, one guy said, oh, this is dear to me forever. He said, words are like a cloak. Yeah. Um, and a cloak can be really good. A cloak can bring warmth. A cloak can bring care and shelter. Um, but cloaks also are, are, you know, what we can use for hiding. Yeah. And I love when and you... And separation from another person's yes. actual touch, right? And what this person said was, I love when you... I, so I love when you use the gifting that you have, but you hold it loosely. And I'm not... Mm -hmm. there. I can even tell a difference more and more of when I have to do it, when I'm doing it for that. You know, let me yeah. show you. Let me dazzle. Let me impress you. Let me keep you close because I'm special, you know? So I'm... You mentioned Enneagram in your... Uh, uh, talk last time, and I'm Enneagram Seven, and I'm basically the enthusiast, the kind of the performer, the you know, if you want somebody to sell something or get people excited about things, I mean, I can I can do that, and I there's a there's a, a dark side to that as well. There's I want you to see the show, the side show, and that's I had to face you know that's that can be a way of keeping you at a distance, like you won't know the real me, and you won't know my real pain. Or my real failure, if I've got you dazzled. Well, and and that part low key cracks me up in the way God put together a four and a seven. <laughs> and I don't know how it usually goes. Yeah. But you like the show. And you ain't the show. And you ain't impressed by it. Yeah. What did you say the other day? I'm chronically unimpressed. <laughs> yes. 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 It's yes. very true. God. In general, and a four values authenticity and honesty. And so when I see your performance, that drives me wild. Yeah. My sensitivity and commitment to actually how things are drives you crazy. Yes. Right? So because it's a, it's a learning curve. It's a combination of my seven and, you know, battling ADD. And some people say, gosh, aren't all ADD sevens or vice versa? I don't know. I haven't yeah. mapped any of that. but. But yeah, I'm like, aren't you impressed? Look at look at the look at the show. But but you can tell you got a good BS detector when it's is there real depth beside it. So what I recognized in this cocooning year is God is changing who I am and how I show up. And the vocational piece still important and still in process. And and what I've done partly with that is having experienced and tasted this healing, having sat with a group of men. And there was no artifice whatsoever. There was no hiding. You couldn't hide. Mm. And you couldn't spin or perform in a way that, you know, Wendell Moss would buy it. Yeah. <laughs> um, or, yeah. or, or Jay Stringer or Adam Young would buy it. They would name, that's not, you know, that's not your real self. And that anger sort of came out some when they went into some of the, that protective anger in some of the same places, but then it broke down and it became profound grief mm -hmm. and there were, or, or another stage of grief rather, because anger is part of grief as well. What's fascinating about this is I'm, you know, as I've gotten tastes of, so I started counseling grad school, ended up starting in the fall. It's been formative, continuing that. Um, and then, um, being called to this sort of place of accessing feelings and accessing grief. And as I've started working with, as you and I work with couples or I work with individuals, um, I sat with somebody beautiful today, uh, just a, a lovely person I've been getting to know and sit with. And I was able just to, I'm inviting them to grieve and, and, and go into those hurt places of their story. And they have a, a horrific story and a story of, of horrible abandonment and pain 
and I felt myself present and different hmm. than How I might have How did you been. feel different? Like, yeah. I might have had this person as somebody I shepherded or cared for in a community group or in a church setting years ago, and I probably would have had some scripture to f- offer them and some kindness, and I would have been compassionate. I wasn't a cold, you know, unfeeling person. No. But today, I... I wept with this person Mm. and for this person who isn't at the place yet where they can even, they want to move into grief and to feel, and yet they're, they're terrified Mm -hmm. and I absolutely get it Mm -hmm. and I'm not pushing them. You need to feel this. Go ahead and let's feel this pushing them. I can't push them into the, you know, the feeling of it all, but I can invite and I can invite and I can say this place you don't want to go where there's pain and there's hurt that you have to name, it's terrifying. Yes, understandably, that place you want to go is the way forward. Well, and you only know that because you've been able to go there. Yes. It's different to tell someone it's that way. Absolutely. Or to say, I've been there and I can tell you the signposts. They'll be different, but they'll be similar enough you'll recognize them. So for me, the the part I wanted to get to is the the transition for me is fascinating because I'm sort of, my word I chose for for this year of 2024 is emergence. Like I've kind of got the one thing. I know I am to be in the world of of counseling and, and mental health type stuff. I'm emerging and going, this is me. And I'm more, I feel more connected to myself than I have been. And it's enabled me to start having more connections. Um, I went through a season where I had lots of brothers. I had um, close Christian guy community. Went through a season of where that was sort of peeled and pared away. And I didn't have it. And you can say, you know, some of it was I left them, some they left me. It's kind of complicated. But in this aloneness that I resonated with what you were saying in the last episode of just the, the things being mowed down. Mm-hmm. Like I, I resonate with, um, you know, um, uh, I've never felt so alone, mm-hmm. uh, than I have in probably the last year. There's, um, a song by Jason Gray that I love. And he says, you know, you say you, um, you, you meet the lonely and the broken. I've never been as low as I am right now. So I'm praying you down here on my knees, Lord, if you don't move, mm. no one else can make a way, you know, just that needing, I need God, I need you to show up. And he has, and he showed up and he started bringing me people and friends mm-hmm. and connections. I'm still not where I want to be on that yet, but I know what I have to offer and mm-hmm. I've tasted. You know, and you know what you want, it sounds like. Yes, I know what I want. And here's the agonizing part. What I've had to recognize is to get there, I've I've had to step back into more of the, the, I'll call it somewhat ordinary, but it's not ordinary, but the practice of law for a season while I'm getting through school. I'm working with a law firm that um, I'm kind of in a consulting role, helping them sort of pivot to be more resolution-oriented and to bring more trauma-informed principles and care into Mm -hmm. this family law work they're doing. And they're doing it with the Hispanic community of Charlotte. It's been such good work and hard. It is. That's been what's been fascinating is just how it's felt at first. I'm like, God, this is taking me backwards. Why am I having to do this Mm -hmm. to go back sort of towards law when I know I want to be in the healing and helping arts, you know, area. And God's like, well, watch this because I, I'm basically, I'm, I'm working with these people, different families, all kinds of stories, all different places. And the commonality is, oh, there's trauma everywhere. Mm-hmm. There is hurt everywhere and they need someone to listen and to be present. And I'm finding, I'm really resonating with what Dan says of how, uh, you know, the, the, the calling to be a healer, to be on the healing path, to bring God's goodness to the land of the living is not so much a what you do, it's how you do yes. whatever you do. Yes. And I'm realizing, wait a minute, the me that I am now, more in touch with my own heart, my own pain, more acquainted with grief, mm-hmm. as Psalm 51 talks about, like Jesus was, the more real I show up, I'm, I'm doing really good work as a lawyer. Yes. I don't think I'm going to be doing it forever. I don't want to be doing it forever, but but I'm different as I'm in the room and I'm in the season of, yes, you know what you're going to be, but you're not going to be there yet. And really, you don't even know what you're going to be. But right. I know this path towards getting this degree and the formation that comes with it mm-hmm. is worth it no matter what. 
because I'm becoming a different person, how I show up. And it is from the, the, the you know, hours of beating the wings in the cocoon yeah. and the forging and the fire, you know. My, I, th- I think the song you were quoting earlier is called Becoming or I'm Becoming. It's, that's the other song that I was going to oh, mention. Yeah, One okay. is Lord my, Move. Yeah, my, my spiritual director, just on the theme you were saying, she yeah. often says, God loves becoming. And I think it's he loves the changing and the growing and the stretching and the becoming more like him. Yes. And that's that's the other Jason Gray song that I am I'm, have on absolute repeat. It's called uh, Becoming. And the opening lines are, I'm miles from where I was, but so far from where I want to be. Um, and he talks about the, the wrestling and the being formed in mm. loneliness and darkness. Um, yeah. And... And basically holding on to, yes, but I'm becoming who I am. Mm -hmm. Um, God's not turning me to somebody new or different. He's actually bringing me to the core and essence Mm -hmm. of me and him in me. You know, the goodness that he put in me to start with. Yeah. Um, Connecting with that. Um, But he says uh, in the bridge in that, he says, uh, it's progress, not perfection, not arrival. It's direction. It's the living and the learning not the finish line, but the journey. Mm, yes. And that's been such a comfort and such a thing to hold on to when I'm like, but aren't I moving backwards? Aren't I doing, you know, I'm spending less of my time on mental health and healing stuff these days for a season so that I can do more. But then I'm bringing these things into play with everybody I interact with. Yeah. And so it's this very weird place where I'm both exhausted and grateful daunted but hopeful yeah. um and and that's sort of one of the points we wanted to make about the formation the transformation um be having to be okay with the already not yet in a new different way having and this o- this slow work of god as yes said. and the non-linear yeah. <laughs> non-linear yeah. it's not theoretical yeah. for me um yeah. and and so i i love being able to be an agent of hope and realness And I'm excited to see the ways that that will keep happening, no matter where it takes me. Me too. So thank you for this conversation. Absolutely. See you guys next time. The Surviving Saturday podcast is brought to you by Nurture Counseling PLLC, a counseling teaching and training center based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. We help families flourish one story at a time. Nurture Counseling provides counseling, counseling intensive for couples, conflict resolution coaching, story work groups, seminars, workshops, and retreats to provide a safe and welcoming context for exploring the agonizing experiences of pain, brokenness, and evil that disrupt our lives, and that God often uses to nurture deeper trust and intimacy with Him and with each other. You can find us online at www.nurturecounseling.net.